So, hey everyone, thank you for joining this event with Joan Rolfeng from the Nuclear Threat Initiative. Uh, my name is Nandini and I'm the president of the Cambridge Existential Risks Initiative. Uh, we will be recording this talk for those who can't attend. If you have any uh, issues with this, please get in touch or switch off your video. Otherwise, please do keep your videos on if you can, as it makes the event feel much more real and enjoyable. Talking to a screen isn't as pleasant as talking to human beings. If you have any questions, you're welcome to post your questions in the chat and we will have a Q&A at the end. Uh, so a bit about Kerry, uh, the Cambridge Existential Risks Initiative is a network of academics and students at the University of Cambridge and beyond working to mitigate existential risks. We currently have a summer fellowship program and we hope to expand our operations over the coming year to have more discussion groups, uh, another sort of conference type uh, collaboration with other areas scattered across the world uh, and much more. So do keep an eye out on our LinkedIn page and Facebook to see what we get up to. Uh, so now to introduce Joan. Uh, so Joan is the president of the Nuclear Threat Initiative, where she manages programs to prevent catastrophic attacks with weapons of mass destruction and disruption, hence trying to mitigate nuclear, biological, radiological, chemical, and cyber risks. So NTI's work really does span a number of fields. It's not just nuclear. Uh, before joining NTI, she held senior positions with the US Department of Energy during the Clinton administration and as senior advisor for national security to the Secretary of Energy. She also served in the US Embassy in New Delhi, where she advised the ambassador on nuclear security. Today, Joan will be discussing new research directions for nuclear risk reduction with a focus on safeguarding the future of humanity from the existential risk posed by nuclear warfare. So over to you, Joan. Thank you so much, Nandini, for inviting me today. I'm really pleased to be here. And um, thanks to all of you who have shown up to hear this talk. Um, I want to echo Nandini's uh, request, if any of you are willing to show your faces, I'd love to see you. It's, it's hard to be talking to a group of black squares. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. Great to see some faces here. I'm going to uh, spend a few minutes trying to set up kind of a little bit of context around a proposed research agenda for moving forward. And then let's open it up to, to Q&A. And I really want to try and be provocative with this talk today. Um, I don't want this to be a dry recitation of you know, potential boring research topics. I want to really challenge you guys to think about you know, where have we arrived in this moment in history in terms of the nature of the threat. Um, I'm here spending my time talking to you guys on a late afternoon in Washington, DC, because I care deeply about the nuclear threat. I think this is the most urgent, uh, the gravest, uh, most immediate threat to mankind of any of the X risks. And yet it's the, the most neglected, it's the least understood. By the way, all of the X risks are neglected and it shouldn't be a competition between them. But um, I've been working in this field for 35 years, and I feel like this is a field that's dying out precisely at a point when the dangers are growing. And I have a sense of alarm about where we are and where we're headed. And so I'm so pleased to see you guys show up to a call because it's going to take your generation to develop the solution sets to carry us to a better place where we can help humanity sustain itself for future generations. So how do we do that? Um, how do we get out of this kind of collective global sleepwalking that we've been part of? Let me just say, most of the nuclear risk reduction um, research that's happening today, I think is not particularly relevant uh, as a solution set. And that sounds pretty damning. And I say this with affection for many of my colleagues around the world who are doing um, you know, yeoman's work, just uh, slaving in the, the fields trying to get something done, but um, we're, we're on the wrong track. I think the, the risk reduction research system is pretty, it's small, it's a, it's a small community, it's blinkered, it's siloed, it's disciplinarily isolated, um, and, and it's limited. 
it's limited to making the existing system of nuclear deterrence less dangerous, as opposed to focusing on how do we create a better system that can get us out of this perpetual box of, of threatening the annihilation of humanity in order to solve it. I don't think that's a good model and I don't think it's gonna be sustainable over time. At some point, something in that system breaks down and it fails and there's a massive catastrophic setback to humanity. We ought to be able to come up with a better system and, and we need a new generation of experts to help us innovate to that space. So before I jump into some proposed area of research that help with that, let me give you my characterization, and this is uh, meant to be provocative, my characterization of the existing system. So I, I don't know, you know, if we're all on an even playing field here, everyone comes with a different level of knowledge, and I'm not going to assume that you guys know anything about the existing nuclear system. So pardon me if I'm preaching to the choir and this is stuff you guys know really well. But let me give you, you know, after 35 years in this field, my sense of where we're at. So we currently rely on a 70 year old strategy called nuclear deterrence for pre preventing a nuclear weapons disaster. It's a system for managing the dangers of nuclear technology whose intellectual roots were defined by your great grandparents generation. That's a really long time ago. So think about that, right? How archaic is that? What other field can you think of that is still relying on a 70 plus year old operating system? So it may have made sense at the time, right? In the years immediately following the Second World War, there were very smart people who came together principally, well, exclusively in the US. Uh, I shouldn't say exclusively, principally in the US, given that um, the US created the bomb. It was a group of academics, government practitioners, military officials, and they reasoned that the best way to prevent an attack was to threaten retaliation against an adversary with a nuclear attack of our own. And there are a lot of reasons for that. And I, we could spend you know, a half day seminar just talking about the, urgen, uh, the origins of deterrence theory, and there's not time to do that today. But suffice to say, that's kind of where we ended up. And the thinking, um, that thinking has kind of stuck with us ever since. Um, you know, the idea that as long as we have an assured survivable capability to respond to an enemy nuclear attack with a massive counterattack, that any attack would be futile and a nuclear war could be successfully deterred. That's the essence of the strategy. It's based on a game theory model it has certain assumptions embedded in it that um, both parties would behave rationally, that there would be time for rational decision-making, that we would operate with perfect information, that we could have confidence in the reliability of the operating systems, that is the nuclear systems. And given the technology of that era, this wasn't entirely unreasonable, right? We had slow flying bombers at that time they could be recalled once they were launched. Um, we had one principal adversary, we being the US in this case, the Soviet Union, who would presumably behave rationally and not intentionally trigger Armageddon. These are all the assumptions that kind of were in place at that time. But let's fast forward to today. We have an extremely complex system today. There's nine nuclear states with some 15,000 nuclear weapons. And, and that number is growing, sadly. Uh, it's possible that not all players in this deterrence game are rational. We have delivery vehicles that are so fast that leaders have essentially five to seven minutes to decide whether to launch a nuclear attack. Our early warning and weapon systems may or may not be reliable given cyber vulnerabilities. We have an infodemic of disinformation and the potential for deep fakes to distort our perception of reality in the midst of a crisis. In addition, we have historically high political um, tensions between key actors, whether that be the US and Russia, US and China, India, Pakistan. I mean, you can choose almost any, any two states and uh, imagine ways in which things could go unintentionally bad. 
So there are a lot of challenges to the whole theory of nuclear deterrence as it was uh, initially created. What happens if a nuclear warning system is successfully sabotaged and spoofs an attack? Um, what if terrorists acquire a crude nuclear device? Do we think they're going to be deterred from using the one the way a, a rational state actor was presumed to be? What if one of the technical components in the, the vast system of uh, nuclear weapons fails? Um, and that's happened before. There are lots of examples of incidents, accidents, near misses that were triggered by component failures. Um, and there's always human error. Right, lots of examples of human error. So we're talking about, we are betting the fate of humanity on a system designed by our great grandparents, by your great grandparents generation, and that it will work and be infallible. It will work perfectly in perpetuity. I just don't find that credible. I think that's unlikely. Um, so, I think it's past time for us to design a better nuclear security system, a better nuclear security paradigm, one that doesn't threaten to end our species and can't cause a civilizational catastrophe if the system somehow fails or if one element of the system breaks down. Um, and I'm Rather than detailing what I think that system can look like, let me tell you about some of the research that's important for us to undertake to help get there. Um, but a couple of other features of the existing nuclear deterrence system, I together, so the Nuclear Threat Initiative together with several other organizations have been embarked on an effort over the last two years to really think hard about how to affect systems change and design a newer, better, more effective and safer nuclear technology management system. And in order to figure out how to build a better system, we started by trying to map the existing system. And that was a pretty interesting exercise. It sounds like, oh, easy peasy, I draw a map. That's not a problem. It turns out somewhat surprisingly, no one had ever attempted to create a visual map of the existing nuclear system, or even to define like, well, what is the system? What's in, what's outside of that system? What counts? And rather than describing it as like a list of institutions, we really wanted to describe that system in terms of the behaviors and dynamics that animate and drive the system. And we have a draft map. We're refining it with a design firm at some point the map of this system will be available to all of you. We're a few months away from that. But there's three really big takeaways, having mapped the system and taken a step back and at the 30,000 foot level, let me tell you what our top level takeaways are about the existing system and the dynamics that hold it in place and have held it in place for 70 years. First of all, it is isolated and self-perpetuating. Let me talk about that for a moment. This is really a remarkable thing. It's like a really effective virus in that it can replicate and continue to replicate itself. And it has for 70 years. So it's that's true because it's closed off from other fields, other movements, other issues. It's opaque. It's not um, transparent or accessible for people. It's ossified. It's really narrow. It runs on a belief system of untested assumptions. I mean, really a deeply held belief system. When you try to challenge assumptions about nuclear deterrence, um, there are many people in the nuclear field who will accuse you of being naive, of being utopian, of being completely disconnected from reality. How dare you challenge my thinking about these untested assumptions of deterrence? They will reply that the threat of nuclear annihilation has worked well and it will continue to well work well. It has saved lives. Um, it's prevented World War III. But this assumption creates a kind of circular logic that the threat of annihilation has worked and therefore must be perpetuated forever is one of the things that, that keeps regenerating this system. So it's deeply entrenched. 
It's stewarded by a small community of individuals worldwide who maintain the authority, the knowledge, and the resources to maintain the system. And it is largely walled off from society at large. Right? How many people do you know in your, not just your generation, but in your circles? Well, you guys are a bad uh, example because I suspect you're all talking to other people who care about um, X risks and by definition have thought about nuclear. But you know, if you talk to the average person on the street, or people outside of your immediate circle, how many of them say they wake up in the morning worried that they might be um, destroyed by a nuclear attack? Not very many. Most people think this is like, you know, the, their parents or their grandparents' generation, an issue that disappeared. It's not relevant to people. And one of the reasons is this is just, it's out of sight, out of mind, um, not at all accessible to average people because the system was not designed to be accessible to average people. So I think of it as a fortress. I call it fortress deterrence, and then I'll stop. That's my kind of first observation about the self-perpetuating nature of the system. It's, it's like a very strong fortress manned by a small but powerful and well-armed cadre of multinational monks. It's literally walled off from the rest of society um, and separated by a very wide moat. The monks speak their own language and their practices are derived from a book with rules and scriptures written in a different era. So that's the first kind of dynamic of the system. I'll go much more quickly through the other two. Second dynamic of the system, um, the nuclear system, it's inherently risky. The nuclear deterrent system is inherently risky. Why is that? Risk is built into the DNA of the nuclear deterrence model because nuclear deterrence is premised on, or at least this is how the practice of nuclear deterrence has evolved. The practice of nuclear deterrence mandates that states have to demonstrate the capability of their arsenals by amassing demonstrably reliable weapons and practicing through their use, through regular launch drills. So most nuclear states, right, leaders in government, and I've done these before, you go through a drill of receiving an early warning and then making a series of rapid decisions about whether to launch or not. And we've had some near misses because of the way those drills are rehearsed and because of the the muscle memory that's being created in the minds of leaders about how they should respond when they get incoming information about potential attacks. And that is an inherently risky posture to be in because it gives you no time to sort out um, fact from fiction, whether the warning signals you're getting are authentic or spoofed. I mean, in an age of cyber, um, what kind of sense does that make, right? And why does deterrence need to operate with um, hot weapons pointed at each other and the pressure to use them instantaneously? That sounds like um, kind of a pretty bad prescription. So that was the second system is inherently uh, risky. The third major takeaway of the system is how inequitable it is. And this is something that gets like absolutely no Lip service, it's invisible to most people. The system is not framed this way, but it is deeply undemocratic. So there's only a limited group of individuals in the world who have the authority to shape or influence world-changing decisions about nuclear weapons. This exclusivity stands in sharp contrast to the scale of the impact if the weapons were ever used. It's in the, you could argue that they're imperialist, and I recognize this sounds maybe like not so, right? But nuclear weapons grant dramatically more global power to nuclear weapon states than other non-nuclear weapon states. And that observation has been at the heart of global debate within the Non-Proliferation Treaty Forum, within the Ban Treaty Forum, the, the so-called treaty uh, for the prohibition of nuclear weapons, the TPNW. Um, that's at the heart of, of those regimes, this um, global inequity and, and uh, unequal power between nuclear weapon states and non-nuclear weapon states. 
Um, the system is also, it's blinkered. It's dominated by insular national security considerations. And because nuclear issues are only framed in the context of national security, we're not thinking about the broader human security factors in, in decision-making about their use. So, you know, what are the environmental impacts? What are the devastating human impacts? What are the secondary impacts, economic, trade, um, human health, et cetera, et cetera. And finally, I would just argue that the system, the nuclear deterrent system is anti-planet and anti-posterity. The problems created by the life cycle of, of maintaining and developing nuclear weapons, um, as well as the potential use of nuclear weapons, you know, those implications are planetary, but they're only thought of narrowly when a nuclear weapon state like the US makes plans for how many it needs, how they might be used. There is no factoring into the equation what might the effects on country X, Y, and Z be? What might the environmental effects be, the health effects, et cetera? So no consideration of the well-being of the planet, the environment, non-human living beings, uh, let alone the rights and well-being of future generations. So I've gone long on my description of the existing system, but I thought that was important to set up uh, what a new nuclear research agenda should look like. So most research today is limited to a small and frankly dying uh, and shrinking community of people in the traditional nuclear civic security sphere. And that research has tended to focus on changing the system at the margins, at looking at ways to, to make the, the existing system safer, but not to replace it with a new system. So looking at things like strategic stability, how can we strengthen strategic stability between the US and Russia to reduce the risk that one of them would be incented to use nuclear weapons? And I don't wanna sound like I'm ridiculing that, that's super important. If we can't get through the next months and years, how are we gonna get through the next decades that are, it's gonna to take to move us into a new and better system? Um, so it's not that this work is irrelevant, it's just deeply insufficient. Um, research about arms reductions, important, super important, but super insufficient. Um, mostly countries are engaged in dialogue with each other about a rules of the road for how they maintain the existing system. What I wanna challenge you guys to think about is how can we disturb the existing belief system to get us to open up our mental bandwidth, our psychological space and our political space for inventing a better system. And how might we break out of this mold? So here's where I, I've got six different research baskets that I would propose uh, we need to work on. So basket one, it's time to challenge the unproven beliefs of nuclear deterrence. Challenge the unproven beliefs of nuclear deterrence. That's basket one. What do I mean by that? Let's expose the ways in which many of the assumptions fundamental to the nuclear system, to the deterrence nuclear system, are flawed or simply wrong. We need to do research to create a deeper knowledge of the underlying myths feeding these assumptions and re-examine them. We need to reveal the ways that human decision-making and behaviors um, They've actually protected us from, uh, that's a little bit of a rabbit hole. I won't go down that, but you know, we need to help people understand how human or machine errors, how new technologies, including AI, can actually increase the risks of accidental and unintentional use. So we need to upend by, by getting under the hood of nuclear deterrence and exposing some of those flawed assumptions. My second basket of research, we need to better understand the consequences of nuclear use. Now you might be saying, well, what do you mean? Don't we understand that? We've tested you know, thousands of, of nuclear weapons over the years and we know all about the prompt effects of nuclear weapons, blast and, and heat and radiation and EMP and so on and so forth. 
And the answer is, yeah, there's a lot we understand about the prompt effects. There is very little we understand about the secondary effects and even less about how those secondary effects might interact with each other. So for example, um, you know, we know in terms of secondary effects, there's been some very good work uh, that has been done and is still being done on uh, the climate effects of a nuclear war and nuclear, you know, so-called nuclear winter and nuclear autumn. Um, and the climate modeling available to us today helps us understand that uh, with some more insights and, and, but not, I won't say precision, there are so many uncertainties in terms of the scenario that uh, yields the climate effects. But, you know, what we haven't done, there's been, and there's been some good associated work by the same team, Robach and Toon, looking at implications for agriculture of a global cooling. But we really haven't even scratched the surface on, all right, so what would that mean for, uh, you know, society at large, for uh, human health, for the economy, for trade, for governance, um, you know, what kind of civil unrest might we have over time if a very large percentage of the population, not immediately, but let's say a year out from a major nuclear event, nuclear exchange, nuclear war is what I'm talking about, a year out and half the planet has already died from starvation because, you know, we don't have a backup plan for production and we don't have a large surplus of food that's banked for more than a few months time. Um, and can you imagine, I mean, if people, at least in the United States, were fighting over toilet paper during, not to minimize the gravity of the pandemic, but what does that look like when people can't eat? And when the governance structures just begin to break down, when the trade system collapses, um, there's a lot we could study to give us some better insights, including there's a fascinating amount of empirical data surrounding historical volcanic events um, that might yield some clues about the societal effects of a major climatic event. Uh, so big research area to understand principally the secondary consequences of, of a nuclear catastrophe. Third major research bucket um, is to actually try and be the architects of a newer, safer system. I think it would be fascinating to get a research group to figure out, all right, well, if nuclear deterrence is so risky and we aspire to a better system, what should that look like? What are our design principles? What new institutions need to be created? What technologies do we need to um, develop to help us with the, the verification? And that brings me to the fourth bucket, which is there's a rich research agenda on detection, monitoring, and verification technology. We need a big innovation agenda. There's a lot we know how to do in the nuclear verification space to verify signatures of illicit nuclear activity and even licit nuclear activity, if that's say, you know, nuclear power, that it's not being, that elements of it aren't being diverted for nuclear weapons purposes. There is a lot we know how to do, but there's so much more we could do harnessing in particular, um, big data analytics and machine learning. You know, we live in an era increasingly where there's no place to hide almost any activity that we undertake. And let's figure out how we can harness those technologies to help us with the verification problem. Fifth basket, governance innovation. So we need new governance arrangements in this new world. But here's what's really tantalizing about that uh, for me. I think we have one-stop shopping with this challenge of figuring out new governance arrangements, I think I would challenge you all to think about what kind of governance structures do we need to manage the Anthropocene? So what do I mean by that? What new norms of behavior and of governance do we need to develop in order to survive the Anthropocene across different X risks, including nuclear? I think if we think about you know, creating a new set of norms about managing the global commons, 
that we will find there are probably governance elements that are common, whether we're talking about rules of the road for AI, for bio, for nuclear, et cetera. And I would love for you guys to dig into that and challenge yourselves to think about what are those norms? How do we create some you know, design principles or rules of the road that helps humanity survive, not just the no next risks, but even the ones we haven't invented yet. We know that no single nation today, this is already true, no single state can secure itself from any one of these technologies. They're too widely distributed. So by definition, we need something that sits above the sovereign level and requires unprecedented global cooperation. And at the moment, we're pretty far away from that. Um, and finally, governance and technology innovation are important, but that's not enough. Um, my sixth and final bucket, and there are probably more, but I ran out of ideas at this point in the time I had to put this together, um, communications research. So that sounds really squishy, maybe not a real research topic. Let me tell you what I mean by that. I think it's really important that we fr reframe the nuclear issue as not just a national security issue, but as a human rights issue, as a legal issue, and as a planetary future issue. That's important because nuclear issue, one of the reasons nobody thinks about it, it's on nobody's radar screen, nobody cares about it, and therefore our politicians don't care about it because no one's holding them accountable. And one of those reasons is that we haven't made the nuclear issue relevant for people. They think it's some abstract, archaic thing that gets managed by a few people at the top of government. And that's kind of true. And therefore, it's not being tended to. So we have to widen the community of engaged citizens. We have to make it relevant for people. We have to democratize the issue. And that's absolutely critical for creating the political space for change, for expanding the Overton window, right? For undermining this deeply entrenched and archaic belief system. This is, in my view, the hardest of the change elements and the hardest of the research elements that I just outlined, uh, but it's absolutely vital. So let me stop at that and uh, open up for questions. I'm sorry I talked so long. I went longer than I intended to, but um, open for questions. If anyone does have any questions, feel free to sort of raise your hand or unmute yourself. I think we did have two questions in the chat. Uh, ah. Should we start with uh, maybe Matthew, if you do want to unmute uh, and just ask you a question out loud, if you're still with us. Okay, I can just uh, read out the question. It's quite a long. Uh... Sorry, I'm I am there. Sorry, I we don't use Zoom at work, uh, so I always struggle with it when I've been away from it for a while. Um, let's see. Let me see if I can also add video. Hmm. All right, don't see how to do that. I guess one talking as a black box. Then um, the thing I would yeah okay so my. You know, my perception up until recently has been what Joan said, you know, which is that the public is largely oblivious to the threat of nuclear war. And, but I've been researching this question recently, trying to gather any public opinion data I can find on sort of public perceptions of the risk. And there is very, there are not very many data sort of on American public perceptions, but there is a survey that was taken, two online surveys in 2018. Where, and I posted the link here, where the authors actually find that people on average think there's a bit under 50-50 odds of having a nuclear attack occur during their lifetimes, which is roughly, as they say, what people were telling pollsters in the early 1980s, mid-1980s. Um, moreover, I've been digging in, I read Russia. I've been digging into the Russian uh, public survey literature on this question, which is much more extensive. There's a lot more recent Russian survey work on public perceptions, the risk of major war and nuclear war. And I'm finding similar things. It's actually as if you know, a sizable percentage of Russians think war is reasonably likely in the next 10 years. Is it, you know, I know this doesn't seem intuitive because that's sort of the, the 
you know, the discourse, the present discourse isn't anything like the early, you know, to mid 1980s. And I can remember the mid 1980s, the discourse then. Um, but I just wonder whether people who are actually in public more worried or at least more inclined to perceive a threat uh, than we think. So it's a, it's a really good question. And let me share a little bit of recent research that we've conducted and both in the last several years and we currently are just, uh, have just gotten in um, the results of an, uh, another research um, team. Um, I, I think those numbers are really interesting. Uh, makes me wonder, you know, what percentage of the public thinks that uh, oftentimes these surveys go out and they narrow the subset of the people that they're even conducting the survey with to be, um, you know, college educated voters who read the news every day. So you have to be a voter, you have to have an education and you have to read the news every day. And that's not necessarily representative of the public at large. Um, others are, are broader. Uh, so it's a little bit hard for me to know how to interpret without knowing um, who the, the actual um, test group was. Um, I will say one of the things we've discovered is when you get people to focus for a minute on the nuclear threat, there is, I think, a high degree of um, you know, understanding that a nuclear threat is very dangerous, could disrupt their lives. It's just that most people don't think about it every day. And a lot of people don't think about it because it's um, frightening and they psychologically shut down. They don't wanna think about it. But in the recent research that we've done, one of the most important takeaways for me is that people actually have a, have a very significant sense of foreboding about the future. In fact, uh, in a quite troubling way, the people that we've surveyed recently and when we ask them open-ended questions about the future, not just about nuclear per se, and we ask them what images come to mind, it's quite a dystopian future that the majority of people portray. They're very worried about climate and particularly in the midst of this pandemic, there is a keen sense of the collective dangers that we're facing. So a real worry and kind of dystopian image of the future. But here's the second part that's really depressing. Most people feel they have a, no sense of agency over that outcome of the future. And so one thing that we're really focusing hard on at NTI now is to figure out how can we give people a sense of agency? We all have a sense of agency. How can we empower that in people and give them something meaningful to do to help affect the change they want in the world. And that's one of the reasons I think the communications, it's why I put it as bucket six on my research list, because we're in the dark ages in terms of how we communicate about the nuclear issue. If we weren't in the dark ages, maybe this would be an issue that more people cared about and felt like they had a pathway to get engaged in. So yeah, I think there's room for a lot more research, Matthew, to help us really understand um, not only how the public perceives nuclear, but how to get them engaged for change. Um, thank you for that, Joel. I think a follow-up question on that might be sort of, uh, in your remarks delivered at the Luxembourg Forum in 2019, you refer to the lack of a clear career path for those who are interested in entering the nuclear security field. Has much changed since you made that comment and what advice would you give to those who are just beginning their careers in this space? Yeah, no, not much has changed since then. <laughs> um, in fact, we're moving in the wrong, we're moving in the opposite direction. Nandini and I were just talking about before she brought you all into the call, um, how the field is shrinking because philanthropy in the field is shrinking. One of the biggest funders of nuclear research has been the MacArthur Foundation in the US. They represent 40% of the philanthropic funding in the field. And they announced earlier this year that they're leaving the field, which was a great blow to an already fragile, demoralized, uh, dying field. Um, 
I think the way we create the career paths is we have to we have to demonstrate energy and interest. We need your generation to make this an, a relevant issue for our government leaders. We need to hold them to account and we need them to invest resources not in developing the next generation of weapon, more lethal weapons, but in investing in the research we need to create a better paradigm for keeping humanity safe um, in perpetuity. And there's been one of my colleagues, um, I keep telling him, please do the bibliometric research to show how the field has been shrinking in terms of the research work over the last several decades. Um, I think some research on bibliometrics would, would really make this case that the research has shrunk and the field has shrunk. Uh, so it's a little bit of a chicken and egg problem, right? We, as citizens, we need to make um, our governments care about this issue to invest more in creating the, uh, investing in the fields and creating the career paths that get, give people space I mean, we see a lot of, I see a lot of young, energetic, um, idealistic, I mean that in the best possible sense. I, I was an idealist who entered this field 35 years ago. Um, young people coming into the field, toiling in the trenches and leaving after five years because they don't see a sustainable path forward that supports the future they want for themselves and their families, that's got to change. And uh, MTI is doing what it can in this space, but we need um, you know, partners in government and partners across a wide range of institutions and disciplines. I think this field, one of the reasons it's so important to reframe this field as a human rights issue, an environmental issue, um, et cetera, et cetera, is that we need to expand this so that there's not a nuclear ghetto of a you know, small group of people with old ways of thinking about the problem. Um, yes, I think Sammy, you raise your hand. Feel free to unmute yourself. Great, thanks. And thanks a lot for the talk so far. Um, so I'm interested just as an individual, I'd like to know whether you think that nuclear risk needs more researchers, policymakers, or something else at the margin. If any given person could go into either of these, uh, which should they go into? And uh, is there a good way to get the, uh, their foot in the door of any of these, uh, these parts? So Sammy, could you, I mean, uh, do we need more people? Absolutely, yes. But is your question where they would have the highest leverage, whether it's in the policy yeah. community or the research community? Yeah. Um, Both, <laughs> That's, that may sound like a cop out, right? But um, so my career has been divided. Uh, in the beginning of my career, I believe deeply that I could have the highest leverage by working inside of the government. And I had some really interesting jobs <clears throat> inside of the government over a 15 year period of time. And while the government is doing absolutely vital work in trying to keep us safe and preventing a catastrophe from happening, um, and I would encourage all of you to consider government service. What's really hard to do in, in government is the kind of deep research, the mold breaking innovation that really has to come from the outside now. Um, you know, forward thinking government leaders are often the change agents that we need for triggering the investment in that kind of um, mold breaking innovation. And so that's something that can be done from the inside of government, but, but really trying to envision new outcomes, that kind of innovation mostly happens outside of the government within research institutions and you know, by prodding governments, by creating movements that demand governments change. And so I think uh, for change to happen, you need both. You need good leadership on the inside 
and good leadership and ideas and political energy on the outside. And you know, career is long. There's time to do more than one thing. So think of your career as uh, you know different stepping stones in uh, you know it could be in almost any sequence. Um, think of it as a series of building blocks that you can stack in different ways. Yeah, I think Joan, your career starting from the U.S. Embassy all the way to the NTI is a very good example of that actually being a true uh, case that you can go from one to the other quite easily. Um, I think, Anna, you had a few questions that you posted in the chat. If you would like to unmute yourself and ask them. Yes, certainly. Uh, thanks for the great talk, uh, Jan. Um, I was a bit uh, surprised um, by um, well, let's say maybe the pessimism <laughs> to work uh, that I have for you. I think because uh, a lot of the news that I see often are that. Anna, see... I'm sorry, you're you're fading. Can you get a little bit closer to the mic? I just lost you a little bit. Okay, is this better? Mm, not really. All right, uh, I have some bandwidth problems, so. Uh... Um. Is your question one of the ones in the chat? Because I can. Yes, uh, if you can uh, read the first one then. That the best proposed first. alternative to the deterrent view? Yes. Yeah. So here's how I think about it. I, I think about nuclear deterrence as being one strategy for preventing nuclear use, right? I, I don't know of even advocates of nuclear deterrence, nobody will say, oh, nuclear weapons are a good thing and we need to use them. That's the good news. There's broad convergence on the goal of not using nuclear weapons. Um, there's almost nobody that I know, I say almost, there's always you know, some exception to the rule. There's almost nobody I know who believes that these are valuable military instruments. You know, the senior most military officers that I have met with um, don't believe they're useful as, um, as military weapons. And, you know, we, I've interacted with a lot of very senior military people. So, you know, principally um, deterrence was developed as a mechanism for preventing nuclear use. The question for us is, isn't there a better system for preventing nuclear use? What if we could develop a really solid system, a rules of the road for managing the peaceful uses of nuclear technology? Nuclear technology, we're not going to uninvent it. It's going to be with us for the rest of history. So we got to figure out a better way to manage it. We have to figure out a better way to manage the nuclear fuel cycle, you know, and uranium enrichment, which produces the fuel for nuclear power can also be used to produce the fuel for a nuclear weapon. Um, plutonium uh, reprocessing can also be used uh, for, for power uh, or for a nuclear weapon. How do we put a system, a transparent system of controls around the technologies that we need to have confidence are under control um, in order to have confidence that this regulatory regime is not allowing some states to develop nuclear weapons in secret. And I think that with the technology and the verification, the, the verification processes that we've already developed together with a few innovations that the new technologies uh, are, can enable us to do, we can build this system. So it's a technology uh, regulation system um, and it would be a legal prohibition against the use and possession and, um, and manufacturing of nuclear weapons. And you know, we already have uh, two treaties that articulate the elimination of nuclear weapons as an endpoint. Um, but we haven't yet built the, the back end verification system, the regulatory system that we need to animate that. And we haven't yet built the political will to put that 
kind of a system in place because deterrence is so deeply rooted that the nuclear weapon states at the moment believe that they're they have defined nuclear weapons as essential for their security so anyway long story short i think we need to make a pro a nuclear uh, prohibition regime uh, real by building the detection, monitoring, and verification system that would be necessary to make it really work. Um, I think a follow-on question on that might be the, you know, the, the first meeting of state parties of the nuclear ban treaty will be happening early next year, if I'm not wrong. So what considerations do you think may help draw parties to the table for multilateral talks and establishing the norms for managing these emerging technologies, which could play a part in a fail-safe nuclear strategy? So um, one interesting tidbit, and this is not maybe widely known yet, but the um, it turns out that at the same time as the states parties are meeting for the ban treaty, that the non-proliferation treaty review conference is going to be held. And so we'll have these two different forums happening at the same time, both exploring ways in which their end goals can be achieved. And, um, I've been following very closely, and in fact, NTI has been leading a, a high-level dialogue with the ambassadors from about two dozen of the non-proliferation treaty uh, countries to see if we can help foster some common ground, um, some actions that those states can undertake together to you know, move in the right direction. And it's really hard because there's this deep divide between the nuclear weapon states and the non-nuclear weapon states. The nuclear weapon states saying, we can't make these move because it might undermine deterrence and lead to a more dangerous situation. Um, really both sides are talking past each other. And it's one of the reasons I deeply believe that until we can succeed in undermining the deeply held assumptions about nuclear deterrence, we're not likely to see the kind of significant change on that journey to a world without nuclear weapons. In the ban treaty forum, um, the challenge is even harder, Nandini, because the nuclear weapon states have shown, you know, they're not states parties, so they won't even show up to the discussion. And it's hard to see how the non-nuclear weapon states on their own, however right they may be, in asserting that nuclear weapons and the nuclear threat is a humanitarian and a human rights issue, um, it's gonna take cooperation by both nuclear and non-nuclear weapon states. So, you know, we're looking for ways to build bridges and foster that conversation, but we've gotta help create the political space for change. Otherwise the same circular conversation is gonna to continue to happen for a few more decades. Hopefully the COP26 happening this November might provide a good model for how those things do work out because I think that conference will have similar issues. Obviously the nuclear ones will be a lot worse in the sense that only half the countries are less than half actually are contributing to the problem. Uh, so, but hopefully that will be a good starting point to discuss how you might- I hope so Nandini, but let's stick with that observation for just a moment because it's so interesting to me to see that in the climate space, there is slowly, because climate disasters are happening every day and it's forcing us to confront that reality. And there's this slow evolution towards forms of cooperation toward a really a shift in our understanding about the, how we manage the global commons, about the environment as a global commons. And we don't yet have that in the other X risks. And it's one of the reasons why I think the reframing piece on nuclear, on AI, on bio is so important because this is really, it's one global commons at risk from all of these threats. And the extent to which we can link these issues, I think will help us um, succeed in each of the issue areas. Yeah, I think that will provide a good model to see how things do pan out that we could actually replicate across X risks, like you mentioned. Uh, I think, Oz, you have your hand raised though. Feel free to unmute yourself. Okay, so thank you for your talk. I think for someone who is pessimistic about nuclear weapons, at least it had some sort of watershed for me. So I think that was great. It shed 
it made me feel a little bit better. So oh, good. my question was related with I think about challenging old system. I wholeheartedly agree with you. I had some chance to also do some research and I'm surprised that we're still on a such a risky and such an old system and we just trust it to this day. But my question is related with challenging the our old deterrent system because even though I wish to do something like that, and I, I think finding a better system would be great. I'm afraid that if we were not to find a new system to replace that, perhaps deconstructing and demystifying that system might cause some policymakers to have other ideas about nuclear weapons like I'm a little bit afraid about demystifying something like deterrence might mean that we might, sorry, so it might mean, mean that it might have the sort of anarchy in our thoughts also. It might have some sort of anarchic situation in our nuclear actions as well. So I was wondering about that. Sorry if my question was unclear. I was also so a little bit confused about my own thoughts. So, yeah. No, I, I get the question. Um, and it's a good question. And it's one that I've struggled with as well. And I think in my own mind, uh, first of all, I don't think we can get to a better future unless we're willing to acknowledge the risks inherent in the existing system. Um, I do think it's possible to hold the old system in mind while shifting to a better system and to acknowledge that, you know, maybe, maybe uh, the threat of annihilation uh, works at least for some subset of the nuclear risks. And therefore we can hold that in place as we move down towards zero but make decisions that, that make it uh, much less catastrophic if it fails. So we could take all weapons off high alert so that we don't have the risk of an unintentional you know, release of those weapons. There's a bunch of things we can and should be doing to, to dramatically reduce the risks of the existing system while we try and put the new one in place. So that's how I think about it. We obviously need to avoid anarchy and people throwing their arms up. And I, and I think we're smart enough to be able to manage and de-risk the existing system while we build a much safer system in its place. I just wanted to also respond to your pessimism about nuclear weapons and say, I think I, I worry that I may have been too pessimistic in my characterization of the threat. Um, I wouldn't have been working and I wouldn't be working in this field after 35 years if I didn't believe we could make a difference. And of all the X risks, I really believe nuclear is the most tractable. The good news is there are only nine nuclear weapon states, right? There are a limited number of states that we need to make this change in. It's not like you know, bio uh, AI that is just, you know, so universally distributed. Um, it's not like climate where we need to change whole economies and, and ways of thinking and, um, you know, the way we all consume and, and utilize energy. So I, I think it is highly tractable, but it starts with a disruption of the belief system because that's what's holding this really dysfunctional and dangerous system in place. I mean, how difficult can it be to convince nine countries to get rid of a bunch of nuclear weapons, right? Well, not easy, but certainly possible. We just need to get smarter about it. On that note, I think Anna's question sort of fits in quite well with that. Do you think a nuclear reactor incident might give a positive shift, some more agency to the field, the way we have seen with COVID and synthetic biology field? Maybe, maybe, but... You know, when I think about Fukushima or even Chernobyl, while Chernobyl certainly had an impact on the Soviet Union, I don't see that it dramatically, oddly, it didn't dramatically disrupt the nuclear weapons debate. Um, I don't know. I'd, I'd welcome your views if you 
disagree, but you would think people would be able to link those two when you see, you know, still today, the no-go zone around Chernobyl, just how devastating that was. But imagine a lot of Chernobyl zones in the aftermath of a nuclear exchange. Um, people don't make that linkage though. Yeah, I think we, you know, it's part of what we have to do is to help people understand, in fact, there is a linkage. There, there could be quite substantial uh, radiation damage in a, in a nuclear exchange. I think that sort of links back to your book at six about communications and improving that. Um, I think we'll have a final question from Matthew, if you do want to unmute and just ask away. Yeah, I, I wish I were actually as optimistic as you are, uh, that, that you think that it's more attractive to climate change. I don't, because I think ultimately we can solve, we may solve climate change by just coming up with cheaper forms of clean energy. Unfortunately, it seems to me that deterrence plays a really useful role uh, that people, states are going to be unlikely, you know, or, or get, it's going to be difficult for them to try to get convince them to give them up. The thing I want to connect, why, you know, when I want to connect it to the broader X risk question that we're talking about in the series here, there are certain kinds of low probability, high impact risks that are characteristic of X risks. Asteroid collisions are an example of that. It's quite unlikely that an enormous rock will strike and destroy the earth during your lifetime or mine, you know? But eventually, if we wait long enough, it will. And then if we value the future, if we think it matters that people exist or people, sentient beings exist for thousands or millions of years in the future, that's an enormous loss. But the state, it's very unlikely to happen during our generation is the problem. Unfortunately, I think nuclear war has that kind of structure as well. Probably if we go on as we are, we won't have a nuclear war while we are alive. If we wait long enough, we will, and then it'll devastate the earth and everybody who lives after that war gets stuffed uh, as a result. So, I mean, I agree it's very, very serious, but if you discount the future, if you don't really care what happens to people a thousand to 10,000 years from now, or you don't care as much, then nuclear war might look like, or nuclear deterrence may look like a pretty good bargain. It probably does reduce the risk of conventional war and um, it probably probably won't have nuclear war while we are you and I are alive. Are we not caught in that kind of problem where the short-term incentives for governments and publics that discount the future may be actually in favor of having nuclear deterrence? So Matthew, embedded in your question are several assumptions that I don't necessarily agree with. And you know, we, we could have a whole seminar around your assumption that deterrence plays a useful role in preventing conventional war. And there are lots of people who assert that and they hold up, you know, numbers of deaths globally over a certain time period from conventional war. And they show those numbers have gone down relative to World War I, World War II. But there are also a lot of examples of how the possession of nuclear weapons made absolutely no difference in, in um, certainly in smaller scale conflicts between adversaries. And I think it's one of those myths that props up deterrence that is actually debatable and where more research should be done. Um, I also think your assumption that a nuclear war probably won't happen in our lifetime is based on some assessment of probability that may or may not be true. Uh, and, and is also unprovable. My own view on it is that there's a good chance that I will see it in what remains of my lifetime, which is a lot shorter than um, you know, most of you on this call. I worry a lot. Um, as somebody who came into this issue set um, at the height of the Cold War, I think the danger has never been greater than it is now. I'm really worried about it. One thing that does wake me up in the middle of the night is um, the worry about a horrific catastrophe that's inadvertent, accidental. I don't think any sane leader chooses to use nuclear weapons. The bar is pretty high for that, but I see lots of ways in which, pardon the French, shit happens. And I've been close enough to stuff happening inside government behind a secrecy screen that um, not to make you guys paranoid, but you know, there's there's stuff going wrong all the time, and it's a matter of time before 
a major catastrophe happens. So um, yeah, I think there's, I think everybody should believe that there's a probability this could happen in their lifetime. That's how I think about it. So yeah, I guess that's how I'd answer it. Uh, I don't believe deterrence plays a useful role. And I think whatever role it may play is dwarfed by the risk it uh, presents for all of humanity. I think as a final question for me, it might be, you know, we have been talking for about an hour about this and it seems like a really heavy topic to work with that nuclear risk, it seems like you hold a lot of responsibility that you need to fix this. And if you don't, it could be the end of the world. So what keeps you motivated? What keeps you going when you know that things could go wrong? Or as you said, pardon my friend, shit happens. And yeah. you're, you're, you're sort of in charge of making sure that it doesn't go that way. Yeah, well, yeah, good question. Uh, I would say, you know, I work with great colleagues and you have to maintain a sense of humor and also be able to, you know, suspend this issue and turn it off and think about other things uh, or you, you wouldn't be able to sustain it. So working with really good people, having a sense of purpose, believing that what you're doing can actually uh, matter for society are uh, things that, that can drive one um, in their career and in their daily life. And gosh, if existential issues don't fit that bill, what would, right? <laughs> Completely agree with you on that one. I think that's a good note to end this talk on. Thank you once again, Joan, for this insightful talk. It has given us a lot of food for thought that I'm sure all of us will go away and think more about. Uh, and thank you all for coming. Uh, I, we have recorded this talk, so I can upload it to our website at some point. Um, and yeah, thank you for coming. See you. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate all of you joining today. Thank you. Bye. Bye.